Okay, you may begin. Excellent. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our fall prevention seminar today with Chris. Um, I'm only going to speak. This is Chris over here. I think it's over here on my side, too. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I, I won't be introducing him too much. I'm just going to say a couple words and then let him introduce himself because I don't want to do any disservice there. Um, as many of you have done our fall risk assessments last month and a couple of you this month, too, and you've started getting in your fall um, your fall risk programs, or I should say your fall prevention programs sent to your emails from the Mobility Matters, which that's Chris's site. So today is kind of piecing everything together and giving you a more in-depth look at it all. Um, and then also on top of that too, if you have not done assessment and still wanna be involved, contact me, email me or call me and we can get that assessment done and get you a program as soon as possible. Um, and now you get Chris. I will at, log out of here and give Chris the full screen. Awesome. Thank you very much for that introduction, Ryan. Um, great to see all of you. I'm going to share screen so we can pull up the presentation for today. Um, it's, it's fantastic to be here. Um, Seattle is one of my favorite cities when the weather is good. So, uh, and every time I've been up there, it's generally been spring, summer, or fall. I've never tried trekking up there in the winter. So maybe I'll have to make that trip at some point and see how I can handle the, the rain and I guess even the snow you all have had. Um, I'm Dr. Chris. It's great to meet all of you virtually. Um, I'm a faculty member in the Department of Kinesiology at the University of San Francisco, uh, which is a Jesuit school similar to Seattle University, in fact. Um, right in the middle of San Francisco, I've been there since 2002. I'm an exercise physiologist, meaning my specialty or expertise is learning how the body is affected, uh, ideally beneficially by exercise. And I've also always had an interest in older adults, started studying them when I was in graduate school back in the mid 1990s as an Oklahoma Sooner and then a uh, Kansas Jayhawk. So if anybody's a Sooner or a Jayhawk, Way to go. Um, and I also uh, now have a business called Thompson Fitness Solutions, where I'm trying to get out some of the information that I've learned through my research program to uh, people far afield and help to educate them on how to program exercise more effectively and assess older adults more effectively in whatever setting they might be in. So that's kind of how this relationship with Horizon House has taken form. I'll talk to you a little bit later about kind of what is to come um, at Horizon House. You guys are very, very fortunate to have a great staff um, between Lori and uh, Ryan, uh, Byron and Deborah. Uh, the fitness wellness staff and the leadership of Horizon House, I think, are, are really very strongly wanting to promote this concept of wellness and uh, fitness in the community. So I'm uh, very delighted to be a part of that. So today's presentation is thought to be a little bit of a, a kickoff to this perspective on focusing on balance training and uh, focusing on data that we gather from assessments that we're doing throughout uh, Horizon House and how that's going to benefit the community as a whole. And so the title is From Frail to Fit, Balance Training is Truly for Everyone. Um, Anybody can benefit from balance training. And ultimately, the importance of doing any type of, of physical fitness training is to try to get the most out of the later years in life, right? I mean, these are meant to be what is termed the, the golden years. Um, not everybody is going to be walking on a sunny beach in Florida, uh, gazing into each other's eyes. But ideally, this is a, a time period where we can still enjoy activities that we've enjoyed throughout our lives, engage in new activities, try new things, never give up on learning, do some traveling. But all of that requires the body to be able to allow that to happen. So we don't want the mind to be willing, but the body not being able to facilitate it. We want to ensure that we're doing everything we can to physically be able to enjoy life. Um, unfortunately though, uh, 
there's a reality of the aging process. One of my colleagues on the East Coast, Dr. Joe Signorelli, he's at the University of Miami Medical Center. He came up with this concept of an aging curve. So what we see here is an orange curve, which really in indicates good aging, and a dark blue curve, which indicates not so good aging. And we'll notice that on this graph, we essentially have on the y-axis, any functional capacity. It could be muscle strength, it could be balance, it could be uh, walking speed, it could be bone mineral density. And that changes over the aging process during a person's lifespan. And we notice early in life, when we're in our uh, younger years, teens, 20s, everything is getting better, almost without needing to focus on it. We don't need to be at the gym every day training in order to increase our cardiovascular endurance or increase our muscle strength. The growth and development process improves those systems of the body, regardless of kind of the behaviors that we're, we're performing. During our adult life, ideally, we're sort of maintaining those capacities by starting to turn a lot of focus toward good lifestyle behaviors, good nutrition, making sure we're engaging in physical activity, uh, avoiding things that might not be good for us, getting good sleep, managing our stress, all of those things sort of help us maintain function. And then as we get to older age, we start recognizing that just the aging process, biological aging, if left alone, the physical body begins to start to show decline. But that rate of decline is going to be highly based on those lifestyle behaviors that an older adult is engaging in. If they're physically active, if they are uh, focusing on good diet, good sleep, good stress management behaviors, have good social interactions, it's likely that they're going to follow more of this orange line where they lose function very slowly. However, if somebody sort of chooses not to engage in enough physical activity or have other lifestyle behaviors that aren't really great for them, then they could start kind of following this, this steeper decline, this blue trajectory. And the important thing to note is that for any functional capacity, there's something bad associated with it. We call that the disability threshold. So let's say we're talking about cardiovascular endurance. Maybe that disability threshold is when you start getting chest pain during cardiovascular activity. Maybe if we're talking about bone mineral density, that disability threshold is a fracture threshold where if a person falls, they're gonna break a bone. If it's muscle mass, perhaps that's a muscle mass that gets so low, people can't lift groceries or walk up a flight of stairs anymore. So regardless of what the functional capacity is, there's always something bad that could happen. So it requires us to ensure that we stay active so that we don't reach those disability thresholds for any of our functional capacities. And ultimately what it really sort of illustrates itself as, as we get older, the aging process, instead of sort of just being an esoteric sort of concept that uh, it, it usually is a series, it's reflected by a series of sort of unfortunate events. We start reaching those disability thresholds in a number of different areas. So maybe somebody in their 40s or 50s, they are a weekend warrior. They're maybe playing softball or basketball, but they don't normally train. Perhaps that's a tear of their ACL, one of the ligaments in their knee. And that kind of knocks them down really quickly. They lose some function because they're immobilized for a while. They can't get to the gym. They're having to go through rehabilitation. And unfortunately, that one event, they maybe recover a little bit from, but then let's say they get some type of uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria, MRSA, and then boy, that knocks the wind out of their sails even more so. And then they start to get better, but because they've lost a lot of function, they have a fall, which leads to a hip fracture a few years down the line. And that again, immobilizes them and knocks the wind out of their sails. And eventually this kind of cascade of unfortunate events, which can all sort of be traced back to the loss of function in these different areas that we see, 
will ultimately end up in a person having permanent disability, perhaps uh, dying of pneumonia uh, at some point down the line. So the best goal for us is to try to make sure this process doesn't even get started in the first place. So we wanna nip it in the bud and ensure that we're always uh, engaging in behaviors that keep all of these different domains of, of function working well so that we don't have this uh, decline that's seen here. And really what, what we look at when we're looking at older adults is that we can't be a one trick pony. You can't just focus on one thing. I, I speak and work with many, many senior centers and residence facilities in San Francisco. And we engage in discussions about, oh, what sorts of exercises do you do? And most people say, oh, I walk every day. And to me, walking is fantastic. It's been identified by the Surgeon General about three years ago as an essential activity for all Americans, something that maintains blood pressure, helps to maintain body weight, gets people outside so they're experiencing nature and having positive um, psychological effects. It's a social activity. We walk with people and have conversations. But ultimately, working on walking only really impacts maybe our cardiorespiratory fitness. So I ask people, well, what's your balance training? What's your strength training? It's great that you walk, but we really need to focus on all of these different domains of function. This is a honeycomb model that's been put forth by an organization that really is very uh, strong in promoting activity amongst older adults. It's called the Functional Aging Institute. And they say, we also need to focus on musculoskeletal fitness, being strong, being powerful. We have to work on things like coordination, reaction time. We need to also integrate cognitive challenges into our physical activity so that we kind of improve our neurological function. We have to ensure we focus on flexibility and mobility so we're able to do things like stretch and put on clothes and, and uh, lift groceries and get down from the floor and up from the floor and take care of all of our daily hygiene activities. And then finally, the area that I'm most interested in because it kind of involves all of this is balance, focusing on ensuring that we're maintaining our function to reduce our risk for falls. So a well-balanced training program needs to include all of this stuff as we get older. Ultimately, what I call it is that we need to all become jacks or jills of all trades. We need to focus on a number of different types of exercise in order to ensure that we age really successfully. Um, and we don't just choose activities that we're good at, or don't just at choose activities that we think are most important to us because all of those domains have importance. Uh, there is a researcher and physician from Stanford who now is in his late eighties. His name is Dr. Walter Bortz. He wrote a book called Dare to Be 100 with about a hundred different tips on how we can improve the likelihood of us turning 100 years old at some point. And his strongest thing that he advocates for is being physically active. He says, when you're young, exercise is a choice. When you're old, exercise is mandatory. That's the only way we can ensure happy, functional, and successful aging. One thing is for certain though, when you comb the literature and you look at research, I can guarantee you that one pound weights, not going to do the trick. Too often when we, uh, especially younger people, people that are in fitness, they, they, they're taught that we can train young and middle-aged people really hard. Let's put them into intense training programs, have them throwing around big weights, carrying sandbags on their shoulders, sprinting, jumping, but hey, let's be careful when we're working with older adults because wow, older adults have all of these issues. They've all got arthritis, they've all got heart disease, they've all got metabolic issues. Um, maybe it's not safe to train them hard. So the unfortunate solution 
is to what we call shrink it and pink it. So we give them little wimpy one pound weights and think that, oh, okay, we're gonna train them sitting in a chair with one pound weights. They're doing something, this is going to help to get them stronger. Ultimately, the evidence really shows that older adults are not going to benefit from a very conservative and dare I say, wimpy approach to training. We need to push the envelope. We need to accurately find out what the capabilities are of older adults and ensure that we're pushing that envelope so that we gain fitness, not just maintain it, or even dare I say, lose it. If you've got somebody who's really active and you put them in a chair exercise class, that hour they're in that class, they're probably getting deconditioned versus improving their conditioning. We need to get them at that level of challenge that's going to do them good. We call that the flow channel. We need to identify the level of skill that each of our older adults has. How fit are they? How functional are they? How well balanced are they? How strong are they? How is their cardiovascular endurance? How is their flexibility? And based on their level of skill in those different areas, we need to select exercises or training programs or classes that meet their level of skill. If you take somebody who is highly functional in this high level of skill and give them a wimpy training program, they're going to be bored. That's not going to do anything for their motivation. It's also not going to do anything for their fitness. Again, it might even decondition them. However, if you take somebody who's of low skill and you give them a really challenging program, that has problems as well. They will probably not enjoy it. They might have issues doing it. They might feel sore. They might have an injury. They might even fall during the exercise program. And that creates anxiety. So our goal is to figure out exactly where everybody is currently in their level of function and choose exercises that match up the level of challenge of the exercise with their level of skill. We call that the flow channel. And that's where we get great returns. People improve over time. They feel challenged to the correct degree. They're engaged with it. They find it to be enjoyable. And this is where exercise can do amazing things. So we want to fit people into that flow channel. Okay. So we're going to kind of now, can, now that we have that sort of understanding, let's talk a bit about fall risk, because that's the thing that we're really focusing on at Horizon House with the assessments that we're doing. But recognize training to reduce fall risk involves a bunch of different domains of exercise. It's not just a one trick pony practice standing on one foot. We do a lot of different stuff to reduce fall risk. So first of all, this has been my career passion for a long time, currently at USF, University of San Francisco, again, since 2002, but goes back to the mid 1990s as a graduate student. My most recent publication which uh, was published in 2019 from the American College of Sports Medicine, was really validating a 12-week fall risk reduction program in the community. We offered programs at 20 different senior centers in San Francisco. We ended up pulling in uh, over a about 100 older adults and took them through this 12-week program that progressed over time and looked at their outcomes versus a uh, control group and found that the development of this particular 12-week program, which really is now what this whole Mobility Matters program is based on, showed significant decreases in fall risk. Incidentally, it's also a great way for me to get students involved. All of my co-authors here were undergraduate students at the University of San Francisco. Uh, two of them have gone on to be physical therapists. Another one has gone on into uh, recreational therapy and another one is a fitness professional. So really great opportunities to make a difference in the community by providing training programs. So this has just been my area of love and interest for a long time because accidental falls really worry me. This picture here is not a stock photo. This is a photo of my mom back in 2009. Um, she's now 83, back in 2009, she was about to turn uh, 70. No, she was just over 70 years old. 
And she tripped and fell and she broke her wrist. I was with her. We were out. We had just seen Cirque du Soleil. Uh, I'm not making this up. We saw all these acrobats doing all sorts of acrobatic things. And I guess that motivated my mom. So we came out of the, the, um, the exciting uh, uh, event and she tripped over a, uh, a raised brick in a walkway. She flew through the air, but didn't land as gracefully as those Cirque du Soleil acrobats. And she broke her wrist. This is not the way a wrist is supposed to look. And unfortunately, it had been sort of a theme when I was a kid. My mom was sort of always a faller. And I wanted to learn more about that and see how I could impact that. And her, her issues really kind of reflect what we see very often in the over 65 population. About 30 to 35% of people over the age of 65 fall every year. It leads to about 3 million ER visits, tens of billions of dollars in medical costs, about a half million fractures. The wrist is the most common fracture, but the fracture we're most concerned about is the hip fracture because the hip fracture immobilizes somebody. It really causes them to reduce their level of activity as they recover. And very often it leads to things like weakness differences, leg length differences between one leg and another and make it very difficult for them to get back to full function. In fact, about 20% of people who have a hip fracture, they don't even survive a year. It's because if they have underlying conditions, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, as somebody is immobilized, those diseases just ramp up and they ravage the person. And a lot of people don't make it a year following a hip fracture. And over 50% of people who do survive a year, they never get back to the level of function they were before. If they were independently walking, maybe now they use a cane or they use a walker or they're even in a wheelchair. So it's, it's a tremendous problem that we need to try to keep from happening in the first place. And the thing that moves the biggest needle in this case in the positive direction is being physically active. Now, why do so many people fall? We can have a full hour on this. There's uh, some great research out there documenting all of these different independent risk factors, some of which exist outside the body, others exist inside the body. Just weather conditions. Again, you guys are in Seattle in the winter. There's a lot of weather conditions when you go outside in Seattle in the winter time that can cause a fall. There's a lot of things in our own homes that can cause a fall. I've got a dog that's back there right next to the fire right now. And sometimes she leaves her little dog toys around. I could trip over those. There are other things, maybe throw rugs that aren't affixed to the floor very well. Maybe we don't have all of the railings and grab bars that we, we need. Fortunately, living at Horizon House, all of your uh, living units have are adapted to safe living. But if somebody's still living out in the community and they haven't retrofitted their, their bathroom and it doesn't have any grab bars, that's not a good situation. Also, maybe somebody's not wearing shoes or clothing that fit correctly, or they're wearing too many layers and it gets caught on a door handle or something like that. So all of those factors um, are significant. Intrinsic factors, there are medical conditions that definitely increase risk of fall. Somebody has a bad knee due to arthritis that changes the way they walk. Well, the way they walk when that changes increases fall risk. Somebody has uh, cataracts or visual issues, obviously they don't see their surroundings as effectively. That can cause falls. Somebody has inner ear issues that make them get dizzy, vertigo, those sorts of things. That can cause falls. Medication effects, um, hypertension, high blood pressure, very, very common in this age group. They take these medications which help lower blood pressure but it makes them dizzy when they go from lying down to sitting up or sitting to standing. That dizziness can cause a person to fall over. Big, big issues. Also nutrition, not all older adults are adequately getting enough protein, vitamin D and calcium. Those are kind of the big three as it comes to uh, fall risk reduction and also uh, not having a fracture if you are to fall. 
Again, protein keeps your muscles strong. Vitamin D both helps with bone and muscle, helps your muscles contract more quickly to stop a stumble. And of course, calcium, which helps build strong bones. And then finally, the stuff that we can address through exercise, gait, balance, muscle strength, joint mobility and flexibility, all of those things. So these factors need to be um, accounted for. So let's consider kind of this average 80 year old guy. He's got uh, hypertension, he's diabetic, and uh, he kind of has an issue that a lot of older men have. He's got benign post prostrate hypertrophy. So he needs to go to the restroom a lot at nighttime. So here's Jim's bathroom, uh, here's his bedroom. And at night, a couple times a night, he needs to get up and go to the bathroom. Well, unfortunately, his medication he's on for both diabetes and for um, his, uh, his hypertension might cause him to sort of become disoriented when he gets out of bed at night. Plus, just like me, he's got a dog that leaves its toys around. So it might not be tonight, it might not be tomorrow night, but at some point, this scenario sets a guy like Jim up for potentially a dangerous fall. Um, so that's not good. And we have to recognize, guys, that our own physiology, we have three defense mechanisms, our vision, our inner ear, and also the sensation in the joints and tissues of our body, especially on our feet, to help us feel the surfaces that we're walking on. Those all get worse. Even if we're active, they get worse. This is in the absence of pathology. Vision gets a little bit worse as we get older. Uh, our vestibular system doesn't function quite as well. So we're not able to correct our posture as quickly or effectively. The receptors in the skin and the joints of our lower body, they, as our joints get stiffer, they don't get turned on as effectively. So we're not getting information to our brain as well. And therefore we can't create as good of a motor pattern or movement pattern in response. So those three systems uh, aren't giving us what they used to when we were younger. So we really are at that elevated risk, which is worrisome. And just recognize guys, balance is a complex thing. We have to show balance, which is this ability to maintain postural control within our base of support. We have to show this in a lot of different areas. We've got the nervous system that's gathering information from our environment. We have to then use our musculoskeletal system to activate muscles and movement patterns deemed to be most safe in those environments. And we have changing environmental con uh, contexts. Maybe in a, a yoga class, our goal is to stand still. Whereas if we're skiing down a ski slope, balance looks a lot different. You're having to stay balanced as you're moving. So this interaction between the task and the environment, our nervous system gathering information, and the muscular system executing safe and appropriate movements, that is a very complex process. It's called a dynamic systems framework, if you talk from a motor learning or motor behavior standpoint. And because this is constantly changing, our body has to be able to respond very, very quickly, or else we might have an issue and have a fall. Okay, so what do we know? We know absolutely positively that exercise can help to reduce the risk of falls. Um, not only the data that I present here from 2011, but there was a recent American Medical Association uh, journal article published. And if you get published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, you're big time, big time. And this study indicated that 11% of falls can be reduced by engaging in exercise. And again, if we think that 30% uh, or so of older adults fall every year, if we decrease that by 11%, well, that's millions of less falls if people just engage in appropriate exercise. That's something that makes a big difference. And 
Interestingly, exercise tends to make all other interventions better. So let's say you manage your medication. Okay, that can help reduce your risk of falls, but exercising can even amplify that. Let's say you focused on home hazards and you've outfitted your house with all these grab bars and stuff. That's helpful and exercise amplifies that to even a greater degree. You get your eyes and your ears checked and you've got a better prescription for those. Exercise amplifies those improvements even more. So really exercise is an essential thing as a part of anybody's fall risk reduction program, but we need to choose the correct components. So when you analyze the literature and look at what really moves the needle in terms of reducing fall risk, cardiovascular exercise has no strong evidence on reducing fall risk, okay? Again, walking is a great thing to do. It maintains weight, it maintains blood pressure, it maintains blood glucose. It has so many good benefits, but don't expect that to reduce your risk of falls. You need other elements in your training program to do that. Yoga and Pilates, it's probable actually, in my opinion, that more research will uncover that yoga and Pilates might affect fall risk, but it's been researched to such a small degree, we can't definitively say it yet. Additionally, just basic stretching isn't enough to reduce fall risk. The things that research points to are joint mobility, ensuring that our joints move through a fuller range of motion, but are also strong and stable. So we can have confidence that they can stop a stumble without rolling an ankle or twisting a knee. Sensory stimulation, getting our inner ear and our vision to work better together to help that integration within our brain, that reduces fall risk. Getting stronger and more powerful with our muscles, that reduces fall risk. Focusing on both static stationary balance and dynamic balance, like you see here, this is June, one of our participants in our community-wide program, basically displaying gait and dynamic balance exercise by going through a mobility ladder. Those are the things that we know reduce fall risk. And some of us may engage in Tai Chi, which is actually a combination of a lot of these elements and therefore has been shown pretty consistently to help to reduce fall risk. So if you're doing Tai Chi, great. You don't need to do Tai Chi. You can kind of do these different exercises in different ways. Those of you who have been assessed already by Ryan and his team now have four homework videos that kind of fall into these buckets of joint mobility, sensory stimulation, muscle strength and power, static balance, dynamic balance, or gait enhancement. So you can be certain that by practicing those sorts of exercises, you're doing your body well and you're helping to reduce your fall risk, okay? Here's a little picture of some of the people at our senior centers. Um, we have been offering programs now since 2006 in senior centers in San Francisco, literally affecting hundreds, if not even probably now, well over a thousand older adults and helping them reduce their fall risk. But a guy like Harry, who is going through a gate ladder and helping his balance by tracing his finger on a wall, we assessed him to be at a lower level of function than Judy and Virginia. So Judy and Virginia are doing a much more challenging exercise, walking through open space while shifting their vision than Harry is because they have earned the right for a more challenging exercise because they were assessed that way. So we need to meet them where they're at because again, we want them to be in that flow channel. So what Mobility Matters does is we take people through three functional assessments. These are the assessments that Ryan and his team are taking you all through. Um, and that's Mobility, oops, let me go back. Hold on, I, there we go. And the assessments that you go through are the reach test, which measures static balance and joint mobility, the walk test, which measures dynamic balance and gait, and the chair stand test, which mu measures muscle strength and muscle power. The reach test, incidentally, this is my father-in-law from Chicago. Um, the reach test has been out in the world since 1990. We basically have a person reach forward as far as they can, 
That shows us how well they can hinge at the hips and show good joint mobility and also maintain their static balance. So this is an assessment that you'd be going through with Ryan and his team if you haven't already gone through it. Uh, another assessment, I'm trying to find my pointer so I can go to the next one, is the walk test. Again, a test that's been done in the physical therapy and fitness uh, world since the early 1990s. Sitting in a chair, walking around a cone that's 10 feet away, come back and sit down. That lets us see how well somebody can move through open space with their walking, tells us how well they can change direction, really gives us a lot of information about their gait and their ability to balance during movement, dynamic balance. Um, and again, another one of the assessments that you do. And then finally, the stand test, which is a lower body strength and power test. 30 seconds of sitting to standing, getting what that maximal value is. Those three assessments are pretty much the gold standard field tests to assess a person's balance capabilities. And then from all that information, we are able to develop an exercise training program. So I'm gonna show you a couple of videos and then we're gonna practice. So let's say somebody, um, and I'm actually gonna take my headphones out so that we can, um, we can hear here the, uh, the audio on these videos. So I'm gonna show Level five static balance exercise. So let's check out a level one static balance exercise. This is a level one static balance exercise with a rotating upper body called narrow stance rotations. This is a really great exercise to start building some static balance capability. Static balance is simply the ability to keep yourself balanced with your feet not moving. Oftentimes we'll see it trained on a single leg or something that's very kind of non-moving and boring. That is an issue because oftentimes we lose our balance through an upper body motion when our lower body is staying still. So that's what we're gonna challenge with this exercise. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We'll take a narrow stance. Your feet don't have to be together, but mine will be to. Oops, sorry, whoopsie. I'm sorry, guys. I clicked a bad button. I'm trying to find my cursor, but I can't seem to find it. Very sorry. Okay. But we're going to challenge with this exercise. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We'll take a narrow stance. Your feet don't have to be together, but mine will be together. I'm going to take a ball. You can use a can or even not use a weight. And I'm simply going to start rotating in each direction. Rotate in each direction while maintaining your balance. You'll feel your weight shifting from foot to foot, and you'll also feel yourself almost feeling as though you need to activate your abdominal muscles and your gluteal muscles to be able to stay in this narrow base of support. Okay, so that's an example of one static balance exercise. Again, not just some upper body movement, but we're not in a very challenged base of support. Now let's see an advanced static balance exercise. Oh, media not found. Well, I will show you an advanced static balance exercise. So I'm gonna stop share for one second. And here would be an advanced static balance exercise. I put myself in a balance challenge position Instead of feet together, I put myself in a tandem stance and I start doing more of a up and down cross body rotation motion. So I'm in a more balanced challenge position and I'm incorporating this up and down motion while I rotate. So that creates some more challenge. And based on a person's reach test result, it lets me know if they've earned the right for an exercise that has that level of challenge or if they need something easier. So that's basically what the process uh, is that we go through to select the most appropriate homework exercises for you in response to your assessments. I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint and then we're going to practice together.
Okay, so what we're going to do for the remainder of the time right now, it is 1110. Let's say for the next 10 minutes, then I'll take questions for 10 minutes. We're going to go through some examples of the different types of exercise that need to be part of a fall risk reduction program. Okay, so we're going to start with the joint mobility exercise. I'd recommend everybody have a little space around them. You want the sturdy chair. And some of these exercises, you'll, want, you'll be standing and near your chair. So just make sure you're in a safe space. This first one is a seated hip mobility exercise. So here we go. This is a level two oh, joint exactly. mobility standing. exercise for the hip called standing hip bumps with an overhead reach with chair support. Really great exercise to drive more flexibility into the hip joint. The hip joint, we need to be flexible. This is a joint that helps us recover our balance if we happen to lose it in different directions. And also we just need flexible hips to live successfully and independent in our lives. So let's focus on that a little bit. What we're gonna do with this exercise is really focus on the front of the hip, try to stretch it out. It gets really tight when we do a lot of sitting. So I'm gonna take a big stride length stance. I'm gonna put my left foot in front, my right foot in back. I'm going to bump forward and lift the right arm using my left hand on the chair. What I'm doing here is I'm simply shifting my weight to the front leg and keeping my trailing leg behind me. So I'm getting a good stretch right on the front of the hip here. Bump forward, bump back. The overhead reach makes my whole body really long, and that even stretches the muscles some more. It should feel pretty good, actually. Let's do one more, and now we're gonna switch sides. Nice, wide, long stance. Reach overhead as we bump forward. Notice my upper body is staying really tall during this motion. I'm not leaning forward. That makes me actually lose the stretch. So I'm staying nice and tall and bumping the hip forward as I lift the hand. Looks really great, feeling a great stretch. All right, so that is a really good joint mobility exercise for the hip. The hip and the ankle, super important uh, joints for balance maintenance. We use our ankles and our hips to help us recover and maintain our balance quite a bit, but they need to both be stable, strong, and also flexible. So these joint mobility exercises help to develop that strength and that stability in those joints. Okay, so we're gonna go to our next exercise, which is a sensory stimulation exercise, working on integrating vision and vestibular function to provide the brain with better information so we can stay well balanced. This is a level three sensory stimulation exercise called turning head with a march. We have three balance maintenance mechanisms within our body. The sensation of our feet on the floor, so basically the sensory receptors in our feet, our inner ear, vestibular system, and also our vision. These three systems work together to help to monitor what our body is doing and help us to maintain our balance and reduce the risk for falls. So here's what we're going to do to train them. We must challenge them. So in this particular exercise, we're going to challenge both the vestibular system and the inner ear with a head turn, which really shakes up all of the fluid in the inner ear, and also will challenge the feet with a march. So I'm so please put a fingertip on a chair if you feel you need to. Um, helps to keep you kind of in one place as we do this exercise. So let's give it a shot. Put these together and do that for one minute. My eyes will stay straight forward looking at you and the camera. That means my vision is going to work hard to keep my balance. All right, here we go. I'm going to turn that head back and forth. I'm going to try to maintain the same position on the floor, you want to make sure you've got a nice, safe area in which you can do this exercise. Make sure you've got no obstacles around you. And you're going to turn your head back and forth while keeping your eyes fixed on something that's not moving in front of you. And here we go. We're just marching with a head turn. 
feet on the floor that are marching causes a little less information coming in to the brain from your feet. And then that head turn causes the vestibular system to provide less uh, effective information to the brain as well. Nice work, everybody. So, and that also could be done in a stationary position. You could put your feet in a balance challenge position, such as a, um, a tandem stance or a feet together stance. Again, whatever the assessments kind of determine is the appropriate level of challenge is uh, where you should be focusing your practice because we want you in that flow channel. All right, let's move to the next exercise which is a dynamic balance exercise. And this is maintaining balance, but during movement. This is a level four dynamic balance exercise Tough. moving in the sideways direction called sideways step to balance. This is an excellent exercise to establish and develop dynamic balance moving in the sideways direction. You may want to practice this one with a chair, fingertip on a chair. So have a chair in front of you um, and practice with the fingertip. This is a level four out of five. So it's pretty challenging. So just be safe. Dynamic balance is really, really important. It refers to our ability to recover and maintain balance after motion. We do that when we're walking straight forward. We also do that when we do a lot of other activities. Additionally, dynamic balance becomes important with fall prevention because oftentimes we'll be disturbed with our balance and we'll have to recover after an unexpected movement. Oftentimes in the side to side direction, somebody might bump into us and we have to take a quick recovery step. So this is a great exercise we can utilize to help prepare us for those situations. So here's how it works. Very, very simple. What we're going to do is we're simply going to take a step to the left establish balance, a step to the right, establish balance, balance and balance, balance and balance. We're simply moving our weight, making sure we're actually taking enough time to know that we're balanced on this foot and we continue to just balance away. And we're going to just move in the side to side direction, continue this exercise. You're the big key on dynamic balance exercises like this is making sure you're really holding the single leg stance. You don't want to go too fast because you don't really need to express balance if you're just going from one foot to another. So the goal is to maybe count to the number two um, or I don't know, say uh, Mississippi twice in order to ensure that you're establishing and maintaining balance on that leg. And if you can't keep your balance fully and you feel a little wobbly, fight for it. So you just kind of spend as much time fighting for it. Maybe every third or fourth step, you might kind of lose your balance. That's fine. That tells me that your brain is trying to figure it out. But if you're falling all over the place on every repetition, it's too much of a challenge and there's too much stimulus for you really to respond beneficially to. So you'd need to decrease the challenge to at least a little bit of a degree. Okay, and then finally, let's go with a gait enhancement exercise. Check this one out. Here we go. This is a level four gait enhancement exercise moving in the sideways direction called side steps with a hip drop. Very important for us to work on gait enhancement or controlling the way that we walk in our environment, whether it's straightforward or in this case, side to side. We want to have good strength in our legs and also good stability in our body in order to control all of our stepping patterns. And this exercise is really going to help develop that because we never know when we might have to move in a side to side direction, either planned or unplanned to keep ourselves safe and keep on our feet. Okay, so this exercise, again, we can do it at the chair. It will only be two steps in each direction. And it's a level four exercise, which includes a hip drop, which is for the strength of the legs. You can always do it without the hip drop. So I'll demonstrate as it's going along without the hip drop. You'll see me in the smaller window. So what we're going to do is use 
in my case, this gate ladder or this mobility ladder next to me, all you need is about 10 feet or so of open space. Make sure it's a flat and a safe surface. It can be indoors or outdoors, but just make sure you're going to be safe. And we're going to move through this uh, particular space for the exercise. So here we go. I'm going to start with my feet together in a balanced, challenged position. I don't want to be falling over, but I want to feel like I'm a bit challenged to keep this position. I'm going to move side with the hip drop, feet together, side together, side together. The reach forward with my hands helps me counterbalance myself as I move through this sideways step. And I'm going to come back. Side together, side together, side together. Keep on going. This is a level four exercise. So it's not easy. We get some leg strength work as well. One All right. Great work. So that's an example of a lateral uh, gait enhancement exercise. These are just examples and samples. Many of you who have had homework sent to you likely are doing very different exercises. The team, Ryan and his uh, team, are kind of determining what the right exercises will be for each of you. And they're sending you through email links to four videos that are really meant to be customized specifically for where you all are at. One thing that I did not show was a muscle strength exercise. And big thing with muscle strength, working the legs. So we're going to practice just one set of chair stands but we're going to actually make it a little bit more difficult. So this would be a level five exercise where we do a chair stand followed by a, um, followed by a calf raise. So here we go. We would be sitting in our chair, hands across the chest. I've got a bar stool, so I'm kind of cheating. Stand up, calf raise. So I come up on my tippy toes, stand up, calf raise. Stand up, calf raise. So I'm both getting the sit to stand and also the extra calf work by doing the calf raise. Now we could do a set of eight to 12 repetitions, or we could go 30 seconds really fast, do as many as you can in 30 seconds with that calf raise, which builds a little bit of power. You could even do maybe 15 or 10 seconds trying to get as many as you can. So it could be both a strength or a power exercise. All right, so back to it, then we'll wrap this up and we'll take some questions in a moment. Okay, so long story short, what does this all mean? So um, according to Ryan, you, there's now been 148 Horizon House residents assessed by those three Mobility Matters assessments. That is fantastic. And apparently all of you have now received four exercise videos that are specific to working on the areas that your assessment results identified as areas that could really be helpful to work on going into the future. So that's really good. Um, the other thing that Ryan, his team and I and Lori are going to be doing Right. Oh, wait, hold on. A little audio issue. I got to put in my. Chris, I think we lost your audio. I 
Sorry, guys. Please let me know if you can hear me now. We can hear you now. Okay. Did you miss all of that? Yeah, Chris, we missed yeah. it all. Okay. All right. So let me go back. Basically, those of you who have been assessed, you've already gotten the four videos emailed to you. Those videos are meant to specifically identify and address and work on the areas that the assessment determined might be kind of weaknesses. So keep doing those four customized homework exercises. Ryan and his team may be actually changing those exercises for you on a pretty frequent basis to keep moving you forward. So the assessment is meant to really give you customized work that you know is specific to you and where you're at right now. Then the entire team, Ryan, Lori, and Ryan's team and I, we're going to look at the group results. And with 150 people basically being assessed, that's a, that's a good sample of Horizon House. And we will be able to see overall what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses. And that will help to then inform what sorts of group exercise programs, are going to be uh, continue to be, or maybe introduced to be offered at Horizon House and kind of how to focus some of the recommendations for people doing their own personal fitness work. Uh, we did a similar thing at a place called the Sequoias here in San Francisco. And we found that muscle strength was by far the weakest area of all of the assessments. And then when I looked at the group exercise program at the Sequoias, there were no muscle strength exercise classes. Everything was balance. Everything was yoga, um, light stretching, uh, cardiovascular sort of activities. So now they're incorporating much more strength training because that's the need within the community. So that's kind of what the goal is on a bigger picture along with the individual programming that we're going to send all of you guys. So ultimately, that's what we're doing here. We're hoping that it really helps to move the um, needle forward on improving fitness and reducing fall risk, and also um, can help to establish Horizon House as a very sort of innovative uh, uh program that's that's customizing a cutting edge uh, intervention as best as possible. So that is basically what we're doing. I really appreciate you guys being part of the, the Zoom today. I'm going to stop screen sharing. You're always welcome to contact me. My email at the bottom, chris at mobilitymatters.fit. And I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. And you can always go to the website too, mobilitymatters.fit, just to see what fitness professionals and people like Ryan are uh, utilizing the platform for. And we do have videos, but you don't need to purchase anything. This is not, Horizon House has essentially purchased a year long um, uh, site license to utilize Mobility Matters. So none of this comes on the residents, but We've got a blog with some helpful information, so please visit it and check it out. But don't worry about needing to purchase any of the videos to go. All of that we've got covered through our contract with Horizon House. So thanks so much for the time, everybody. I'm going to stop uh, the screen share and let's take some questions. We've got uh, a few minutes. I'm on as long as you guys need me. Okay, Chris, we're coming over. We just talk right into it. Sounds good. How long ago did you take that promo picture we saw in the flyer? Uh, it looks like 20, 20 years ago, huh? You don't Wait. want to know. That's, it's, it's, Maybe 30 uh, years ago. We all age. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I need a good one, but they don't come out so well anymore. <laughs> that was probably 2012, I think. <laughs> Hi, I was just uh, wondering, you didn't mention anything about repetitions, you know, how many times per week, you know, that sort of thing. Could you kind of go into that a little bit? Sure, sure. Um, the majority of these elements that we know contribute to fall risk reduction and, and training balance 
they don't really require a ton of recovery. So your sensory stimulation, your static balance, your dynamic balance, your gait work, that can be done as often as one might like. And really there may be a dose response relationship. So practice some of those balance, gait, and mobility exercises every day. However, the strength and power training where we're actually stimulating the muscle groups, we would think that we probably need a little recovery between uh, days in order to have them uh, rebuild and, and restructure effectively. So the strength and power exercises two to four days a week, the rest of the exercises as often as possible, every day if possible, we'd say about 60 seconds for your sensory, your mobility, your balance and your gait exercises and say one to two sets of eight to 12 repetitions of your strength exercises or all out for 30 seconds for your power exercises. Those tend to be kind of what would be considered the, the best loading of a fall risk reduction balance training program. So this is a legit question. So um, <laughs> you, you dissed the uh, pink one pound weights. So if we're moving away from one pound weights, what should we move, be moving to is for, uh, I think we divide it into women and men or older and younger or something like that. What, what kind of weight should we be using? Yeah, great question. Um, the best thing to do would basically be have a selection of dumbbells and you want to feel by the end of your eighth or 12th repetition, again, for building strength, it really seems like sets of eight to 12 reps are most effective. And you want to feel significant fatigue within the muscle group at the end of the eighth to 12th repetition. If you feel like you could go for 25 reps, too easy. If you feel like, boy, I really have to use and start getting bad form and use your whole body, to get to eighth or 12th repetition too much. So with good form, you want to feel essentially fatigue in the muscle group by the time you get to say your eighth repetition. That's the weight that you want to work on for that particular muscle group. Obviously it might change depending on the muscle group you're working with. Your arms are generally going to be weaker than your back. So for back, you might need eight pounds, 10 pounds, 15 pounds for the arms. Maybe it's five pounds or seven pounds. You kind of have to play around with it a little bit because it's very individualized. Um, I have not received my videos or if they went to my junk uh, mail, I don't know about it. So I don't know if that's a big problem or if just an individual problem that I can deal with with Ryan. Okay. Are there other people here who didn't didn't get their responses? Ryan's nodding. Yeah. Okay. So that's possible. Um, because the homework is sent from Mobility Matters, it's possible that a spam blocker might block it. Another option, which Ryan and his team know about, is he can actually copy the specific link that would be sent to you from Mobility Matters, and he can send it from his email. So you would definitely get an email from Ryan, and that link will then take you directly to your Mobility Matters video. So maybe Ryan and team just kind of see who did and didn't get the Mobility Matters email, and those that didn't, send them the login link directly from your own email. And then you should be able to follow it and you're good to go from there. And I know I probably typed in some email addresses wrong. So we're gonna stay after here. And if you didn't, if they didn't get one, we'll write your name down and send you a link later today. You can't hear me over there. I'll, I'll say it louder in a second. Yeah, just uh, you mentioned barbells. Uh, what about the uh, exercise machines? The weight, those, um, those. Uh, which is better? Should we can we use either one? You can use either one. Um, definitely, exercise machines are great. They focus on one specific muscle group generally, or maybe a couple if you're doing something like a leg press exercise. 
The only issue is that the evidence seems to suggest that we get a little bit more of a balance and stability challenge when we're doing, say, an exercise standing up with an external resistance. So if you're sitting in a chair and you're leaning back against a cushy pad and you're pressing a weight out in front of you, that maybe helps to condition the muscles that create the power to push, but you're not necessarily having to be in a standing position, maintaining your body weight as maybe you're pressing a elastic resistance away from you. So um, machine resistance work is incredibly effective at building strength. I would just want to make sure that you're also incorporating kind of those balance, sensory, gait challenges in there as well. So we're not just missing the postural control pieces that you really can't stimulate through um, resistance machines. I think we're questioned out, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I'm answered. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, fantastic. Again, I'm really, really grateful for um, the opportunity to work with Horizon House. It's been great interfacing with, uh, with Ryan and Lori and Deborah. I haven't met Byron yet, but I'm sure I will. And um, I look forward to seeing how things go along this year. We'll be in contact regularly. And um, at some point, Given what happens with Omicron and who, what's next, Rho or Sigma or just as long as it's not Omega, because that's that's the end. Um, whatever comes next, I'm hopeful at some point I'll be able to get up to Seattle and, and make a visit. I've also done some work with Washington Athletic Club in downtown Seattle. So it would really be great to come up and touch base and say hello and uh, visit you all in person. But until then, virtually... Keep up the great work and you're you're in great hands with the fantastic team there. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Chris. All right. Bye team.